Hello everyone and welcome to the Habit Tracker Minimal API core series. In this video we will create a new project based on the Minimal API template, take a look at what's behind the scenes of how to run a Minimal API and what was added to the c -sharp in order to enable us this application model, and as well add a couple of API endpoints to our Habit Tracker Minimal API. If you like this kind of content and would like to see more, feel free to subscribe and click the notification bell. It will help me a lot. Okay, so for our habit tracker backend, we will be using the minimal API template that comes with .NET 7. I'm using Rider, so this is the setup that I'm running in Rider. You could use Visual Studio and create a minimal API project there as well. Is just as easy. So I'm going to name my project Habit Tracker API. The solution name Habit Tracker. Why this differ? We'll go over into a later video. So SDK is .NET 7. Uh, the type is empty. Language C Sharp. So I'll create it and fast forward. The solution has been created. We have our range settings, the app settings file, the app settings development file and the program.cs. From the program.cs we can remove this line of code for now. And you might ask what the hell is going on over here? Where is the main method? Where is the program.cs class, etc.? Well, it now looks more like Python code, to be honest. So if you've been developing with .NET Core API in the past, you might have been used to a startup.cs class and a program.cs class looking otherwise. Well, these are some features that were brought to C Sharp to accommodate the minimal API programming model. And Microsoft calls them top level statements and implicit global using statements. Okay, so the feature that removed the program.cs main method is called top level statements. What it basically means is that you already are inside the main method when you enter the program.cs. It's already there. So you see this args argument passed in here. It's basically the one that is passed to the main method. We no longer need to have all that boilerplate code. It's already implicit in it. Uh, about the global using statements is basically you don't see over here the usings in the program.cs those are there as well. Basically, Microsoft allows us to reuse all over our application code, the using statements, the packages that we most frequently use. Well, now you might have an idea. Well, great. Now we can use this kind of structure everywhere in our code. That's not really it. Top level statements are allowed for only one file in the entire solution, which is basically this program.cs over here. The compiler will generate an error if you use it in more than one place. So we don't have that Python light code everywhere. Now over here we have three lines of code and this is basically enough for us to run the API. So I'm going to go to the launch settings.json and remove all the profiles that I don't currently need. Okay, so basically this is the profile that we will be using. And if I run it right now, it should start on port 7113. And this is great because we only have three lines of code for running the API. We have a lot of Scooby-Doo magic behind the scenes that does the work for us but yeah minimal APIs minimal number of components we have three lines of code and running an API but we can't really call it an API until we have a couple of endpoints over here so I'm going to stop it sorry about that and add an endpoint which basically would look something like this app map get specify the route for it and then a lambda Now you might be pulling out your hair about why the hell is this even valid C sharp because in the past we would have had issues running our lambda like this because you would have to specify it like the following using the following structure so we have a string which basically hello world this would have been valid and is still valid C sharp code, but this wouldn't have compiled even before. Basically what happened is, well, lambdas received the following 
improvements. First is we can now specify attributes. Next is we can have explicit return types for our lambdas. And third, we can infer a natural delegate type for lambdas and method groups, which basically translates into us being able to run methods like this in our API. So if I run this API right now and run a request against this endpoint, I will get a hello world. Okay, so that's great. Next, we will take a look at other components that we have in our application. So right now we have an app settings.json file where we have specified the logging configuration. So the default logging level is information, uh, information and the Microsoft ISP not core is warning. Uh, yeah, uh, for other environments, if you run, for example, locally, or you, if you have a staging environment, you will need to have a couple of more app settings files. So this over here is our app settings development JSON, which will override the main app settings file when we will run it in development mode. If you need to run it, for example, in staging or some other named environments, you will have to add another app settings dot your environment name dot JSON. For example, we have staging dot JSON and we use that app setting to override the main app setting file when running in that sad environment. For now, we will leave it like this and just go over to the launch setting file. Over here, this is the profile that we've configured before. So right now, right away, you can see that we are running on HTTPS localhost 7113. From here, we can change the port number or add, for example, we want to run it in HTTP. So yeah, you can configure that as well. There are, however, other ways to configure and to run it and to override this said application URL. Basically, if we go to program.cs and over here, for example, I would want to specify to run it on a different URL or if we don't have this at all. So let me copy it for now and then delete. So for example, if I want to run it on another port, let's say let's say I want to run it on this port, if I press the run button, it will automatically run it on the set port. However, I wouldn't recommend running it like this, but you need to know that you can do that as well. So I'm going to stop the solution for now and take a look at how we can do it otherwise. Over here, we have the SPNet core environment variables. I'm going to return back the application URL and just comment it out for now. Over here, as said, you have SPNet core environment variable. You can specify other environment variables. For example, you can specify here port. So you could run it on H6666. And then in your program.cs, you would have something like this environment, get environment variable, sorry about that, and you pass in the port name. If you run it like this, you'll see that it automatically picked it up and it's running on the set port. Well, that's great, but if you want to run it on multiple URLs, you could do it like this as well. So I'm going to add a new URL. Uh, I'm going to copy this value from here, remove it as well, and then paste it here, duplicate and run it on port 6090. Remove the environment variable and just run it. And as you can see, it runs on two ports, the ones that we've specified in the app URLs. You can even go with approaches like any interfaces. This is something I've picked up from the Microsoft documentation. So you have it like this, and then you might specify 9898. Personally, I wouldn't do it like this, not with environment variables or anything like that. I would default to the natural convention one, so I don't have any code in any 
redundant code in my program.cs and run it like this from the application URL and leave it here. The DevOps guys will say thank you for this because it's easier and it's straightforward for them to configure and they don't need to know any of our internal conventions. As well, you can specify it when you execute .NET run in your terminal with the flag of URLs. But yeah, this is not really an approach I would go. And if I'm honest with you, probably the best thing you can do is run it like the standard way. As I mentioned previously, it's configurable and it's easy to use. So enough with the ports themselves and how to run the application. Let's return back to our program.cs. Over here we have, I will leave this endpoint that we currently have to return a string. But if we want to emulate a more realistic API endpoint, which would look like this. So it's a, an apt-get API v1 habit. So we want to retrieve a habit from our database or I don't know or some other source. So over here we can specify results.ok and then here send a new anonymous object which will contain the following properties, basically a name and let's say habit of learning.net core. And if we run right now our API and I go to the postman and enter the path that I specified over there. So it's v1 slash habit. And if I send this, it will automatically return me a 200 response with the property set for habit of learning .NET Core. This is great and all, but what if I want to run and specify, for example, that I want a habit with an ID of one? How do I do that? Well, for that, we will need to add over here, basically it like this. So it's an ID and we can specify the type of the passed in value, which is basically an integer. There is a plenty of different specifications that you can add to your API roads. I will add a link to all those specifications from Microsoft documentation to the description of the video. So we've added the ID to the route and now I want to access it in the results.ok part. Over here, I will need to add a from route attribute. Uh, I don't need this. And use it like int ID. So now I do have access to the ID part over here. So if I format this a little bit and run it again, and just run my request, you can see that it's taking it from the route just well. Yeah, this is great. And for example purpose, let's take a look at another constraint that we can add. For example, we can use a minimum value of zero. So if I run it right now, and in the postman I run it, it will be totally fine. But if I specify over here, for example, minus 10, it will return me a 404 not found, which basically means that it will not find the route to the set endpoint. And yeah, this is just one of the ways you can constrain your routes in the minimal API. Okay, that's great. But let's take a look at some other extension methods that we have over here. So we have map, get, delete, patch, post, put, when, etc. But for example, I was using in an API the method link, which I don't think they've added yet, but worry not. There is a way to add those endpoints to your minimal API with using the map methods, extension method, where we specify first the path. So for example, we have link, now let's do it with a lowercase and then we can specify an array of verbs to respond to. So basically over here we have link and the method itself. So basically hello from link. Okay, so let's run it like this 
and then over here I will take and create another window for my postman and try to run it in a link so yeah you can see that you have hello from link response that we have in our map method so in this way we can map methods even if we don't have the concrete implementations for those HTTP verbs in minimal APIs, like for example, how we have it with the link. This was all for today. And in the next video, we will talk about parameter binding because that was the first question I had when I saw minimal APIs for the first time and add the rest of the remaining API endpoints for our habit tracker API. If you've enjoyed this video so far, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel and yeah, leave a comment. It really keeps me motivated to produce more content like this for you. Have a nice one.